It's the Morgan Evans More or Less Pickleball Podcast coming at you in three, two, one, boom. My guest today is an internationally recognized good guy. Glenn Peterson is one of the few players who I believe has mastered the art of partnering. An important topic I think we can all agree, so we'll get into that. He's also an engineer, giving birth to the famous Selkirk Omni Paddle some years ago. We're going to discuss what he's working on during COVID, what it will take to keep developing the game, and some great tips for beginners and pro players alike. The man has won more medals than I've had hot dinners, so please welcome Glenn Peterson. Glenn, how you doing, mate? I'm wonderful, thank you. Oh, happy to hear it. So tell me, what's been going on? It's been a while, obviously, since there's not much pickleball going on. It's hard to catch up with uh, all the Selkirk friends. What's new in your world? You know, we've been playing ever since the weather got nice. The gym was closed once the COVID-19 hit, so we were not able to play indoors but ever since the weather started getting nicer, we started jumping fences <laughs> of course, at parks in this area and started playing. So we're back up playing three times a week. I live on six acres with a big garden. And so COVID-19 is kind of a non-event for me personally. But yeah, we've been playing. It's been wonderful. The weather is great. So there's been a lot of new courts built in this area a lot of tennis courts have been striped so the play has just gotten better and better nick williams has been playing with us and there's some really really great younger players emerging in this area what about you oh good yeah so uh, riverside county they opened sports like tennis pickleball and golf they reopened them fairly quickly i think they were were only down for about a month uh, maybe five weeks or so And then they allowed those particular sports to reopen under some provisos, obviously. But yeah, so it hasn't been too bad in in that sense. It's just the heat right now. You know, it's it's, uh, 110 to 120. (laughs) Um, It's a little warm. So, you know, I'll get some play in, but it's typically early morning. And a lot of the lessons that I would typically lean on to keep me in check, unfortunately, tend to leave, head back up to Seattle or head back up to Canada. But we're making do. We'll survive somehow. Well, I have fond memories of when you used to come up here at least two, if not three summers. One summer was with Kaiwen, but I have fond memories of those summer days playing pickleball locally at the senior center in Redmond. Yeah, yeah. Those were the days. You were one of the first players I ever played with. You and Mark Friedenberg, Don Pascal, Chris Miller, Brian, Tanya. Seems like only six years ago, and that's exactly what it was. It was it six years ago. Yeah, yeah. Summer of two thousand fourteen was when I first got the bug, and Pickleball Central. It was it was all because of Pickleball Central. Actually, I called them. I uh, had no idea what they were, but it might have been during the days of a Yellow Pages. Probably not, but yeah, someone put me in touch with them, so I called them up, and they gave me Yoda and Don Pascal's number, and I just kind of yeah, went from there. I met you at the senior center. Bob's your uncle. That's right. That's right. In some ways, so it's one of the best years because I was learning so much. You know, in age, I hadn't hit that intersection where I was still getting better. Age wasn't deteriorating. Now I'm fighting that. You know, it's I'm on, the, on that cusp of my skills getting better, my body deteriorating a little bit. But but I'm playing great. We're we're just I'm having a ball right now with pickleball. So great. Well, then you're winning. You're on top of it. Yeah, it feels good. Sometimes it's hard to bring that game to a tournament. And so I'm having so much fun locally that it doesn't really matter. It's just, it's great exercise. I'm playing well. It's fun to hit good shots and and great camaraderie. So Yeah, yeah. They were always such a nice bunch up there. So tell me, what do you think kind of stands in the way? What kinds of things stop people from being able to take their the the level they bring to the table in a recreation game and then transfer it into that same kind of level in a tournament? You know, that's a great question. Well, that's what we do here. We ask questions, good questions, ideally. 
Yeah, maybe a couple of things. The first thing is, I think a lot of people pick up a paddle and they want to finish a point. So you're hitting the ball hard and aggressively and they haven't figured out that pickleball is really a calm, rhythmic sort of sport. It's more of a classical music sport than a rock and roll sport. At least, at least that's the way I think of it. And so they're trying to hit winners and players who are cagey and have played for a while are able to just continue to get balls back until they hit a ball in the net or hit a ball long. So probably the first thing is you know, developing some consistency so that the floor of your game is raised a little bit. That's one of the things when I think about beginners. The other thing that beginners don't like to do is they don't like to volley. They like to take a ball after it bounces. And the ball only bounces about 40 to 50% of the height, the maximum height that it reaches in the air. And so they're always taking a ball at a lower point and backing up. And, and I encourage new players, love to volley, love to take a ball in the air. It's a higher ball. You have a much better chance of putting your opponent's off balance by taking a ball in the air. So move forward, even though it doesn't feel like the safe thing to do. Again, the other thing is people pick up a paddle like a tennis racket and they, and they, there's a lot of wrist action and a whole lot of motion and arm motion. And I encourage people a compact stroke. The ball is smooth. The paddle smooth. It's hard to put a lot of spin. You're, you're probably the best at it, but it's hard to put a lot of spin and grab a ball. It's, the ball doesn't want to be grabbed. The paddle doesn't want to grab it. And so a flatter, more compact stroke with less wrist is a better stroke. It sounds like I've been going about this game all wrong. I should probably uh, come up and take a lesson. I do love a good good amount of wrist and uh, a fair amount of flair. Well, I've got to rethink this, maybe go back to the drawing board, keep it, keep it simple. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna <laughs> teach you anything, that's for sure. I think I think you are the best mind and the best commentator in pickleball you're a natural commentator i'm laughing hysterically when you're commentating pickleball but you probably also have the best mind in pickleball but i'll tell you what a ball at 80 degrees or 110 degrees a dura anyway is different than a ball at 40 degrees on a cold morning and it's harder to grab that ball at 40 and so you show up at a tournament it's 58 degrees and you're you know it's harder to grab that thing and put that spin so at least that's what I find. Yeah, no, you're right. It's. I do wonder if they're ever going to be able to kind of normalize the you know the vast differences in ball speed that weather brings to the table. It's going to be. I know it's going to be tough. The I've talked at length with as many different sort of chemists as possible about you know the composition of the typical balls we used, and it it seems like it is an incredibly difficult task to make a ball that's both durable stays round goes as fast as we want and isn't affected by the weather now you're you've got an engineering background and i remember when you first started tinkering around building the omni and you know we noticed wow this is a different looking paddle but then sure enough within a year or less i forget how long it became an incredibly effective paddle and popular paddle in the selkirk lineup can you talk to us a little bit about your experience with you know balls and how that whole kind of ecosystem works. Is it possible to build a ball? Is it possible to build the perfect ball, I guess? What do you think? So I I feel like I spent a lifetime working with the Dura ball. We owned Pickleball Central. I'm I'm an employee there. And we owned the Dura ball until Onyx bought it. And I also spent a ton of time with the USAPA and the Jugs ball and the Onyx balls. And plastics, I learned are not easy. The chemistry involved in plastics are very complex. And so when they changed the bounce rules, it was extraordinarily difficult to make the jugs ball compliant. And in fact, we never succeeded. So it's a mystery to me. I'm an engineer, but the chemistry involved in the, in the balls are a mystery to me. And the number of manufacturers now pursuing the ball that you just described, the one that doesn't change in weather, doesn't break prematurely, bounces consistently, but preserves the game that the, I don't know how to say it, but the old guard at the USAPA wants the game to remain 
a game with long rallies. So they don't want us to be able to grab that ball and rip it and favor tennis players who bring in that skill set. So that's the challenge. Uh, you know, the onyx ball, the pure ball, the fuse, they were a lot easier to grab. And Dura has been difficult to grab. And so by nature, that's the way it's going. And my understanding is as we go forward, there's going to be a coefficient of friction limit on paddles. And that's going to relate to the ball. So the coefficient of friction, it's not just roughness, it's a glass might grab a, a Dura ball at 100 degrees more than, than a piece of sandpaper. So they want to govern it so that we, we can't, the game doesn't get accelerated with shorter rallies with a ball that's easier to grab. So I, I honestly don't know the path forward. All I know is it's very complex whenever it involves plastics and the chemistry. So just backing up slightly, what you feel like, you know, the USAPA, the old guard, so to speak, even though, you know, they're doing great things for the game, it isn't a secret that they would like the traditional sense of pickleball to remain intact. Do you think at all that that could basically stop or slow the evolution of the game? Yeah, I do think that that's true. In one way, is I'm almost 60, I'm 59, and I love the fact that I can still compete with a 25-year-old. And I think it's partly because of the ball and the paddle, the limitations on balls and paddles. But I also think the game is not very entertaining to watch. It's very entertaining to play. But seven, eight, nine years ago, when I started playing pickleball and watched the best players in the world, I thought that looks very simple. And I would much rather watch Federer and Nadal play tennis than to watch the best pickleball players in terms of entertainment value. So if entertainment value is one of the things we're pursuing, then allowing the equipment, both paddles and balls, to evolve, to have it become a more aggressive game might be wise, but it will make it so that I cannot compete with a younger player. Well, I mean, perhaps not a younger professional player, but you, I think they'll always, because of the, the kitchen, and there's a diminishing returns in terms of uh, you know being able to hit a ball that much harder than it, it's currently being hit and still be able to keep it in the court. There's only so much top spin you can produce and still have it go not too high above the net and know that it's going to dip down into the court with that spin you know i just wonder if the game is shooting itself in the foot if we don't allow the progression of you know ball and paddle technology to make it more exciting because regardless of what the limitations on balls and paddles are you're never going to stop the human element sports science helping people create more power and more spin in the same way that it's you know it's done with every other sport since the beginning of time right now I, when i look at some of the speed coming off ben and deckel and a few other players steve deacon you know the kind of kind of power they're putting on just your average sort of drive it's enough to scare small children and it's not like the paddles magically <laughs> overnight became became rifles. It's been a slow progression, but they've figured out how to incorporate enough of their tennis technique. But it's not like they're hitting textbook tennis forehands. They're, they're just not. And I, I always wonder what pickleball technique is going to look like in a couple of hundred years. Because I don't think it's just going to be trickle-down tennis strokes. At least I hope not. I would say that you you set the bar for serving it strokes, you know, a third shot drive five years ago. You really set the bar for because I remember, you know, trying to defend some of your serves here in Redmond and you would rip them so hard. But it was very dependent on the temperature that when that ball was soft. And so I believe that allowing the equipment to evolve to make for a more entertaining pickleball, reduce the barrier to entry even more. It's a game that has a very low barrier to entry. A beginner can pick up a paddle and enjoy the game right from the start, unlike tennis, where it seems like the threshold is higher. But the more we let equipment and balls evolve, the lower the barrier to entry gets. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, oh, for sure, 100%. We still need to grow from the ground up, uh, grassroots, you know, get uh, that base of players ideally starting to become younger and younger, and then, you know, see see how it's possible to kind of have a cake and eat it too, let the game progress at the rate that it can, while still allowing, you know, the vast, vast majority of players to, you know, enjoy it for the, the reasons why we do so much, how, how inclusive it is. You know, that's, the, that's the secret to it, it's popularity. 
Oh, Glenn and those sultry tones. I could listen to the man all day, but we're going to take a quick break for a little word from our sponsor. So, you're engaged in a dinking rally, and it occurs to you that you're getting picked on by your opponents. Maybe your soft game is weaker than your partner's, or perhaps your opponents are just testing to see if you can handle the pressure. For now, we need a strategy to get you off the hot seat. Most players are far more comfortable dinking cross-court than they are down the line, and with good reason. There's a lot more margin for error cross-court. To get yourself out of trouble, it's time to start dinking down the line. Not just once, not just twice. Do it continuously until your opponent either takes the risk of attacking you or redirects to your partner. If they are comfortable dinking down the line with you, then you can instantly make yourself the most dangerous player on the court by straddling the sideline and the kitchen line. Or if you're feeling very ambitious, by attempting the famous Ernie shot. Remember, it's the threat of these things more than anything else that's going to force your opponents to think twice about attacking you and you'll get off the hot seat. For more lessons on a variety of topics, go to coachmepickleball.com. Geez, that's a good tip. I should probably start doing that. Let's head back to Glenn. So tell me, you know, obviously COVID has affected everything. What kind of habits have you been working on, either personally, professionally, anything going on? What's tinkering up there for you? There's a few things that I've been thinking about when I play, and I've had a little more time to drill. Normally, I, I only play games. We show up, we drill for or warm up for, for five minutes or even one minute, and then we start playing games. And professionals don't do that. They drill most of the time and then they show up for a game. So there's a few things. One is that, as I mentioned before, I'm trying to think of pickleball more as a dance than just a short burst of energy. And so moving, gliding over the court, saving my energy, being more relaxed and more calm. And then at the net, my tendency is as somebody hits a ball at my chest, I tend to rise up. Some players like Don Pascal used to just leap in the air. So the feet are coming off the ground and, and people are often rising up. And if I stay low and stay calm and see the ball off the paddle. So that's, what, that's one of the things I'm working on is to be more stable, keep my feet planted, remain calm. You know, a ball fired at you 14 feet away, there's a certain reaction that's unavoidable. And so overcoming that instinct to react and staying calm and stable again you do that as well as anyone another thing i'm working on is in tennis we used to talk about back bounce swing very simple concept i see the ball come off the racket and i know i'm gonna it's gonna be a forehand or a backhand immediately turn my body sometimes a pickleball doesn't come off the ground in a consistent way so if my paddle's already back I'm not trying to rush a paddle through a ball that comes off the ground differently. So I, I'm turning right away so that my paddle is back before the ball bounces. And then the other thing is I've even got a little device to attach my elbow to my belt and try to keep my elbow tucked in and keep my wrist locked open. I didn't learn tennis to the level that you or many others. I was just a high school tennis player. And I noticed with Nick and you and others that wrist, there's not a lot of wrist action going on in the stroke. You keep that wrist locked open until the very end. And so I've even got a little device to hold that wrist open, keep my compact a little bit more like a ping pong stroke, keep it more. So it's my legs that are generating the power and there's very little variability in my arm and in my wrist. So I would I try to encourage players, try to, try to use your body to strike the ball, take some of the variability out of the stroke. And then the last thing I'm always working on is, is to keep my head down through a stroke. <laughs> because what happens is, is I'm thinking about the ball coming back, right? It's, it's and especially coming back hard and fast and, so if I keep my head down through the stroke, see the blur of the ball, and then and have a target in mind rather than looking up as I stroke, I tend to not hit a ball in the net as much. It all sounds very interesting. I, I, I do love the, the thought of having a more stable wrist for the purposes of consistency. And I think, yeah, anyone, anyone listening who is you know just starting to pick up a paddle and 
getting going, you uh, cutting out the sort of variables that a wrist, fingers, and, and to a certain extent elbow as well, if you can keep it simple, stupid, so to speak. Yeah, when I think of your stroke and I have an image in my mind of, you know, of a forehand drive, you do a good job of, of using the bigger muscles and the idea that the big muscles don't break down and keeping that head steady. You know, you, you're much more likely to have some fatigue in your, in your wrist and even your fingers, depending on how hard you grip a paddle at the end of the day, if you're utilizing, you know, those smaller tendons, ligaments, muscle groups, as opposed to the bigger ones, as you mentioned, legs and I think core to get your, get your power. Yeah, that's good food for thought. God, people are learning a lot today. Yeah, and I'd rather, I'm okay with hitting an underhanded rather than a sidearm stroke. I, nearly 60 years old, I, you know, bending over for three hours is a tiring thought. So I, I don't mind hitting a ball the way I would toss a softball, you know, pitch a softball. So sort of an underhanded stroke works fine for me and fine for a lot of us older players. It's time for another episode of Morgan Evans, Lightly Filtered. Today is all about giving advice. One of the things I love about this game is how quickly people can pick it up and start enjoying it. Every day I meet new players, wide-eyed optimists that have their whole pickable lives ahead of them. Three months later, they've gone from a 3-0 to a 3-5, and suddenly they feel an uncontrollable urge to bestow their newfound wisdom to anyone lucky enough to share the court with them. Have you ever seen this happen? Once in a while, one of these players will ask me a question regarding coaching. How do I know if I should give them advice? To which I, I typically respond when the check clears. If I could advise all the weekend warriors turned zero zero coach just one thing, it would be this. Be careful. Be very, very careful of giving new players advice. As the twig is bent, so grows the tree. Think of new players as children. A blank slate that you can easily mould into something, anything. Pause for a moment. Is your advice going to send them down the right or wrong path? So, if you're someone who feels the need to coach other people on the court, there's a couple of questions you should ask yourself before dishing out your advice. Firstly, has anyone asked for your advice? If not, that may be your first clue to just encourage but not advise. One of my favourite filmmakers, Baz Luhrmann, once lyriced, that advice is a form of nostalgia. Dispensing it is a way of fishing the past from the disposal, wiping it off, painting over the ugly parts, and recycling it for more than it's worth. That's a little glum, obviously, but a hell of a quote. The next question you might want to ask yourself is, how well do you know this person? The right advice given by the wrong person can easily fall on deaf ears. And if you've just made seven unforced errors, then don't be surprised if they're not too interested in what you have to say. Moving on. Is it the right time to give advice? There is a time and a place for everything. Yeah, usually college. <laughs> no. Technical stroke production advice should be certainly left for the practice court, and ideally handed over to a qualified coach. Tactical advice can be helpful mid-game, however, exercise caution and keep it to the basics like keep it to player A, or let's try to dink the third ball. Paralysis through analysis is very real, so be careful not to overload someone with information. Do you know how best they learn? Men are usually very visual learners, while women can be more auditory. You'd be surprised how many people do indeed know how best they learn. Ask them. Remember that communication is a two-way street. The message you are saying and the message a person receives can often be two very different things. Adapt your teaching style to their learning tendencies for a better chance of impacting their game. Have you earned their trust? The first thing you need to do to help implement any change in a player is this. Get them on board with the change. If they don't believe in the change, no amount of rhetoric will drill the concept home. A huge part of this factor is how much do they believe in you as a coach? And unfortunately, if you're not a qualified coach or have a truckload of gold medals, then don't be too surprised that whatever change you might be suggesting, even if a fantastic coach says the exact same thing 
If it comes from you, it again might fall on deaf ears. Lastly, and this is a tough one, are you trying to help them because of your honest desire to be helpful? Is it to win the game you are currently playing? Are you a control freak? Or are you simply trying to reinforce your sense of superiority with the ego boost that an advisory role gives you? Be brutally honest with yourself on this one. Because if your reason is the latter, people will know soon enough. If I'm honest with myself, I became a coach for at least three of those reasons. So there's my little rant for the day. I appreciate it if you listened. If not, no worries. Now, I'm never going to tell you that a 3-0 or 3-5 player can't be a good coach. So much of good coaching is just good communication. However, there's a time and a place. And you may realize that you're going to make a whole lot more friends if you just leave that coaching hat on the rack. Okay, let's head back over to Glenn to wrap up another game-changing interview. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about the kinds of things that make you a great player. I've always, I always say that on any given match in a, in a high-level tournament, you can't always choose if you're going to be the best player on the court, but you can choose if you're going to be the best partner. You're someone who I've always admired in terms of your partnership skills. Is there something you think about or what kind of uh, mindset do you have, well, especially when it's a new partnership? What gives you that kind of edge in terms of being an internationally recognized nice guy on the court and off, it seems? How are you able to kind of gel so easily and therefore, I think, get the best out of your partner? Thank you for asking. I consider myself a mediocre athlete. And so attracting good partners has been probably the most important thing I've done in terms of gold medals. Well, you've won singles as well, let's be honest. Yeah, yeah. And you're very aware of the magic that happens between two players in a particular tournament on a particular day in a particular match. And if that magic isn't happening, probably you're not winning. And there is a, a flow in pickleball. Points generally get strung together. You know, so you win two, three, four, five, six points in a row. And that comes when two people are really in sync, emotionally in sync and playing in sync. And for me, that requires a flexibility, a calmness. So I, I can play well with players who are more emotional and more fire, and I'm a little more ice, a little more calm. When you have two type A players, sometimes that doesn't work. Also, when you have two very placid players, sometimes the fire doesn't come out. So being able to calm a player, making sure that everything is always good between the two of you, that, that sort of all good, it's, it's all good. I don't care. You know, I know that we're, we're both putting everything we can, can turn a quarter. So if you lose three, four, five points in a row, not being patronizing, but also you know, sometimes not communicating, but sometimes a little communication can be, can be helpful. And then, then being flexible. I, I think, Morgan, one of the playing with you, I, I partnered with you on a tournament in Central Oregon. You may remember that. It was one of the very first tournaments I ever played. Yeah, and I, I remember at one point saying, I think we were playing Wes and Brian. It might have been a medal match. And I said, I said, Morgan, we're not going to win this match if you're not on the left side and if you're not taking over this game because I'm not going to beat these guys. And you kind of looked at me and, and I said, and I think I might have even said, you're going to take the third shot on these particular points because I'm not getting my third shots in now. And so recognizing the strength of your partner and being willing to let that strength, you know, rather than just asserting myself and saying, I get half the shots no matter what. I did that with Nick Williams once. We won the tournament in Yakima and Nick just took over. And I was able to hold my ground barely. Yeah, I played against you. You played amazing. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. And I was, it, it, okay, that's right. You were in, the, and, and I really didn't play that well, but Nick played out of his mind. And so, recognizing and i you know I've, I've been scott moore's partner really scott and i used to battle in singles and he called me up after nationals one one year and he said how about we try doubles together he says i don't know if i'm any good or not and we won nationals consecutively for consecutive years two or three years in a row after that i just count it to the fact that scott knew i was going to be a battler he knew 
So he was much better than I was in doubles. So I've had really, really amazing partners. I partnered with Wes Gabrielson, one of the worst tournaments I ever played. He treated me like I was just wonderful. Enrique did the same. I played terrible, but I played with you. I played with Nick. I've, I've had the greatest partners. And sometimes the memories I have of tournaments, you know, memories of Larry Moon and Ken Crocker, and Tony Tolinar, Scott Clayson, Steve Dawson, Brian Staub, Billy Jacobson, Jay, and Travis, all these guys I've partnered with. And I have some really fond memories of the camaraderie. You know, Brian Staub's blue eyes, steely eyes when we were in a, when we played the tournament, just and this smile, these and Larry Moon, this that smiles, you know, between us in a match. I have fond memories. You know, they say sports develops character, but I would say it reveals character. And the character of your partner, it's so fun to see it come out in competitive situations. Yeah, you you very rarely know, you know, exactly what kind of animal you're going to be standing next to until you've, you know, really gone into the trenches with them. And you're, you're exactly right in terms of if two players aren't in sync, whether it's one of their faults or both of their faults, or just the fact that you know, the relationship isn't working. It can so often be, it's no one's fault. You know, just because a relationship fails doesn't mean a person does. And every partnership is a, you know, it's a, it's a micro relationship. And avoiding playing the blame game, uh, I think is something that I, I see in a handful of high level players and it allows them to continually attract other great players and they'll do well together because Everyone knows that if I partner with Glenn Peterson, for example, if we have a bad day in the office, we're still going to be mates. We'll still have a beer, life goes on, you know, and we'll probably still have another go at it. And that's, there's so much insurance you know, when you have that feeling going into a match that I think people can play their games a whole lot more easily than if you're nervous about disappointing your partner or nervous about you know, what kind of reaction they might have if you don't play well. Interesting stuff. Yeah, I, when I watch you and Tyson partner, what I come away with is they really look like they were enjoying themselves on the court. It's just a fact that when you were really enjoying yourself, which was all the time, you played fabulous. And you were able to shrug off the bad moments and move on to the next. And I see that in professional tennis where even you know when a player makes a, a partner makes a a wrong shot or they still tap paddles they still have their little consultation and it's all good and the relationship transcends the moment yeah yeah no it, it really is and i think that's it's it's one of those x factors that you who knows if you can really learn it um or if you, you're just kind of born with it being able to basically be friends and get along well with a lot of different people and knowing that in the heat of battle emotions are going to rise and if you're lucky they're good emotions and you know together uh, the level of support excitement camaraderie and willingness to to go that extra mile for each other you know there were many many times where tyson and i i often looked at him and said listen my legs are shot i'm cramping here <laughs> cramping there right. and uh he right <laughs> He would often, I'd have to say, I'm going to need you to just take over uh, these next four or five matches. Is that cool? And <laughs> that's good. <laughs> and he would often say, uh, no, I'm probably going to need you as well. And vice versa. But usually his uh, his legs were fresher than mine. He's, God, he's got good legs. It's, uh, it's depressing. He does. Yeah. He does. He, he, he deserves to wear those shorts. He really does. I, I would wear those shorts if I could get away with it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Well, Glenn, uh, this has been an absolute privilege. I'm sorry we you know, didn't do it sooner. We'll definitely schedule you back on if, you, if, you'll, if you'll have us. I'd love that, Morgan. Thank you for asking. You do this sport a great service. It's, it's a privilege to talk with you. Oh, you're very sweet. I'll uh, well, put in a good word with Selkirk again and we'll get you back on soon. Yeah, thank you. All right, mate. Well, you take care of yourself. Say hi to Paula for me. Next time, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about your mixed doubles uh, with, with Paula because that's always intrigued me. But for another time, that'll, be, that'll be, give us something really to have a good powwow about. I'd love that. All right. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, Glenn. Will you take care of yourself? Stay safe. And we will see you soon. Thanks, Morgan. All right. Take care. Well, thanks for listening today, folks. I'm Morgan Evans, and this has been More or Less Pickleball.
This podcast was powered by Selkirk. This podcast is also brought to you by the next generation of Selkirk Paddle, the Vanguard. I'm Morgan Evans, and this has been More or Less Pickleball.